this week on the Back Table Podcast. And so what I always tell patients, because it's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, is that, you know, they'll say, well, I was scoped and they saw reflux. Well, no, um, you can't see reflux because it's happening in your esophagus. What they saw were signs that looked like your larynx was irritated. But again, that's not a direct definition of LPR, right? Because lots of things can irritate. So the reason we scope is to make sure we're not missing something. LPR can have different subgroups and subtypes. And so I think if we can, as a field, have a little bit of consistency and understanding that it's not just an acid problem, I think we will help our patients a lot just by that. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Back Table ENT podcast. We're a podcast that focuses on all things otolaryngology, and we've got a really great show for you today. Thanks for stopping by. Now a quick word from our sponsor. Cook Medical's otolaryngology head and neck surgery clinical specialty strives to provide otolaryngologists with minimally invasive solutions to address unmet needs. Areas of focus include head and neck, otology, and laryngology, with products ranging from a full suite of interventional silendoscopy products and the Doppler blood flow monitoring system to the BioDesign otologic repair graft and the Hercules 100 transnasal esophageal balloon. For more information, visit cookmedical.com forward slash otolaryngology. Now back to the show. I'll be your host today. I'm Ashley Agan, a general ENT in Dallas, Texas. We've got a great guest today. We've got Inna Hussein. She is a board-certified otolaryngologist who completed her training from Northwestern and then went on to do a fellowship in laryngology from Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary, a Harvard teaching hospital. She spent seven years as the section head of laryngology and associate professor at Rush University in Chicago, and now will be transitioning to Northwest Indiana to spearhead a regional voice, airway, and swallowing program. She's been actively involved with education as the associate residency program director at Rush as well as an active member of the AOHNS Laryngology and Bronchoesophagology Committee. She is also active on social media as the hashtag throat doc, and she uses her platform to educate and advocate for patients. Her clinical and research interests include idiopathic subglottic stenosis and LPR, laryngopharyngeal reflux, which is what we're going to get into today. Uh, Welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Ashley. Before we get into it, Maybe just tell us a little bit about you, where, where you came from, um, how you became a laryngologist, just a little bit of background to kind of set the stage. Sure, I would love to. Actually, I was introduced to the field of otolaryngology actually as a child. So my mom's actually an otolaryngologist. So um, I'm second generation, kind of grew up very familiar with tonsils and ear tubes and all that stuff. I ended up going to medical school because I thought I wanted to become an oncologist and treat patients with cancer. But once, you know, once you start in medical school and start exploring things, you find different areas of interest. And I found that it was really drawn to the head and neck anatomy. I'm sure there was a certain component of familiarity associated with that and comfort. Um, But I was really fascinated with how intricate everything was. And so I ended up going into ENT. And then laryngology, I actually didn't really know really much about it at all until I did a pediatrics rotation. Um, And we spent a lot of time, it was actually here in Chicago, and we did a lot of pediatric airway cases. And I I just loved it. I mean, I was like, this is, I think, what I'm supposed to do. But my heart just wasn't in treating sick kids. And I I didn't think I would be able to be strong enough to do that. So I kind of remember asking my mentors, how do I do this, but with adults? Like, is that a thing? And they're like, yes, it is a thing. It's called laryngology. And I was like, wow, okay. And so the first time I think that I really kind of got immersed in laryngology as a field was actually on the interview trail. So when I went around and interviewed for fellowships, and I'm so glad I I did because I I absolutely love it. I I think it's like a perfect fit for me. I really, really enjoy kind of the topics um, regarding voice, airway, and swallow. Um, I love the in-office procedures that we do. And so I'm a laryngologist, um, like 100%. And so that's kind of what what I do now. That's awesome. Did you you find that you were maybe trying to not be an otolaryngologist because your mom was one? 
Like, did, did was there a feel like, oh, I, I'm, you know, like, I'm just... You want to always want... I'm going to make my own way. Yeah, you kind of always want to do <laughs> yeah. your own thing. Yeah, your own thing. I um, I remember I, like, studied abroad and I was, um, I was actually in South Africa on an anthropology type of program because I thought I wanted to maybe go into public health at the time. And, you know, you, you try different things, I think. I don't think I actively was like, oh, I'm definitely not going to be an ENT. But it's so funny how what you're exposed to really gets embedded into who you are and your outlook in life. And, and I think that definitely played a role. And you've got the, you, were you at um, UT Southwestern for medical school? Did I read that? I was. Yeah, I was. We got that Dallas connection then. Yeah, no, for sure. Awesome. Well, let's um, let's get into, you know, LPR, laryngopharyngeal reflux, um, silent reflux. There's many names. You know, when I think about it, the, the more I, I think about you know, LPR, the more I feel like I have no idea what I'm doing with it. And, you know, like if I'm treating it right, if I'm like, what's the latest, you know, um, treatment algorithms. And let's just kind of like talk about like, what is it? And, sure. you know, how do these patients present? Yeah. So as ENTs, I feel like we're all very familiar with the term LPR and silent reflux and how it can definitely cause a lot of throat symptoms. The way I describe it to patients is I essentially tell them LPR is basically a bunch of symptoms that have to do with your throat. So things like sore throat, globus, voice changes, mucus, throat clearing that we think are caused by reflux. And so we give them the term LPR. We know it can also contribute to ear issues as well as things like postnasal drip and chronic cough. So it's interesting because LPR, when kind of it was first coined in the 1990s and then in early 2000, kind of a formal definition was given by the academy, it really was just focused on issues of the larynx related to the effect of acid reflux. And that's kind of initially what the diagnosis was. We know now that it is so much more than that, but unfortunately that understanding hasn't really transcended in, into kind of the general population of physicians or even ENTs. So the most recent definition that's kind of out there is actually from 2019, and it basically is a much more complex definition. And so it's the effect of um, both acidic and non-acidic reflux that's both direct and indirect on basically the entire upper aerodigestive tract. So much more complex definition of what LPR really is. And I think that problem with that is because it is such a complex definition and there are so many subtypes of LPR that we don't actually talk of it in that way. Um, that's why the diagnose plan. Um, so I really think LPR should be defined into subsections, kind of similar to what our rhinologists have done for chronic rhinosinusitis. I think we as laryngologists definitely need to do that for LPR as well. Wow. Okay. So there's a lot to unpack there. So when, if we're thinking about the definition, so we have direct and indirect, meaning that some sort of reflex is directly coming up and irritating the tissues of the larynx versus indirectly through some other pathway. And then we have acid and non-acid. And so break those down for me. Would you... How, what would be the different categories? Sure. So the easiest category would be direct acid. Right. And that's, I think, what everybody thinks about. Like, that's kind of the traditional, Correct. like, okay, that's yeah. what's happening. Okay. The very traditional, right? So acid is coming up, it's touching my throat tissues, and it's causing me problems. So very, very easy to understand that. The second would be the direct non-acid. So this is the idea that digestive enzymes actually are not only acidic, they're non-acidic as well. And the big player in this is pepsin. So we talk about pepsin a lot. So pepsin is actually coming up all the way up to the throat and causing tissue damage. So that's direct non-acid. Then we have kind of the indirect category. So this is the idea that like their reflux, which simply means movement, can happen in the distal esophagus. And what happens distally is sensed by the throat. Right. So we think that this is more of a neural mediated type of symptomology that occurs. And this has been well documented in the GI literature. You know, you can you can dilate a balloon in the lower esophagus and patients will grab their throat. Right. Because that's where they feel the tightness. They've placed catheters and they've injected extra acid in the lower esophagus and patients feel the burning in their throat. So we know that there is a neural mediated indirect form of the most challenging one to treat. And that one, that one is, is indirect is like basically acid and non-acid. Those are kind of together. Correct. Okay. That's, that's really helpful. In thinking of these, do they happen individually or overlapping? Like do people, is it like, okay, this person has direct acid, so I'm going to treat them this way. 
and this person has, you know, indirect, so I'm going to treat them this way. Or is it all of these things are kind of overlapping and potentially happening at once? Yeah, I would say definitely, definitely can be overlapping and happening at once. And that's why it can be quite challenging. So usually when I really get into this with patients, usually kind of on the second or the third visit, we really try to break it down into when and where the problem is and what is the problem we're trying to address. Because if you think about it, all of us can have direct acid LPR, right? We've all felt it, right? So that can definitely happen. But is that necessarily a problem or is that an isolated episode? And I think that's one of the big distinctions we have to help patients make. By the time they come to see us, usually it is a problem because these symptoms are happening more than just once in a while and occasionally. So once we lose that really temporal relationship and it becomes more of a chronicity issue, that's when I think we start to see more and more of the indirect LPR because now it's starting to become neurosensory and that's when it really becomes chronic. So, you know, you've seen these patients, right, where it's like all day they're throat clearing or all day they feel mucus. Well, those aren't all day of having episodes because that really doesn't make sense for most of the patients. That's where you've really developed neurosensory or indirect form of LPR. When you see these patients in your clinic and you are kind of getting that initial history, are there some key questions that you're always asking or, you know, are there key things that patients talk about or bring up that kind of, you know, help you think like, oh yeah, this definitely sounds like, you know, they're having some indirect reflux or is it just, I know we all kind of have that typical, like, you know, I've got the mucus, I've got the post-nasal drainage, I've got, you know, that's pretty common. Then we're, then we're going like, oh, like, you know, what's, what are we going to see on scope? But is there, are there anything particular questions that we need to be asking that are important in kind of helping focus things? Yeah, I will tell you that a lot of this is I I, am somewhat privileged, right, in terms of being kind of the subspecialist who people are coming specifically to talk about LPR. So I do have a little bit of a privilege here in that I can sit down and kind of like really hone in on just this one specific thing that they're having, as opposed to, you know, having to see multiple different types of problems that are coming into my clinic. So when I talk to patients, I usually they've already been referred in, for example, by another ENT or perhaps even primary who a primary physician who's somewhat familiar with this idea of reflux. And so they've probably tried a few things. So when they come into me, we kind of take a step back and I say, okay, I need to hear what the problem is. Like somebody else called it globus. Somebody else is calling it throat clearing. Let's start fresh. What is it that you're actually feeling, right? Are you coughing or is it throat clearing? Is it that you're feeling mucus dripping or are you just throat clearing so you think it's mucus? Like that's the very first step of all of this is like, what is the actual thing you're feeling? Because I've had multiple times where it's written that they're coming in for globus and I don't know about you, but when I think globus, I immediately think like the lump in the throat, right? Like a tightness. And they're like, no, 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 there's no lump. I'm just throat clearing. So the globus actually was a sensation of mucus, which in my mind triggers a different pathway of what I'm thinking about. So that, that's what the very first thing I say is like, what are you actually feeling? Let's not define it. Let's just say what we're feeling. And then once we get the feeling, then that breaks it down into what type of questions I'd like to know, right? So for example, if it's a globus type of thing, I kind of really want to know, is it all the time? Does it come and go? Does it wake you from sleep? Those type of questions. Do the same thing with kind of the the mucus sensation, right? So um, I really want to make sure that I don't think it's coming from a nasal source. So I definitely ask my general nasal type of sweat um, symptoms. And then it really becomes a, a time thing too. Like, are you noticing more mucus and phlegm after you're eating and drinking, after you've been outside, first thing in the morning? I mean, when when is it happening? And if we can pull out some of those characteristics that starts help building my differential. Um, and then to be honest, sometimes people are just like uh, all the time, right? That's all they can tell you. There, there, are no sim- there are no triggers. It's just all the time. And that makes me very suspicious for a neurosensory component because what could possibly be happening all the time? Yeah. It's like that word congestion. Like I feel like mm-hmm. people like, you know, I just have congestion and it just can mean so many different things. You know, sometimes yeah, that's it's a great like, example. Sometimes it's like yeah. stuffy ears. Sometimes it's like, you know, a productive cough. Like, <laughs> right. No, so no, like, I 100% yeah. agree. What yeah. is congestion? Yeah. What what exactly are you feeling? With LPR, do you find that for one patient, it can be 
mucus. And then for another patient, it can be throat clearing. Like it can be different predominant symptoms, even though it's kind of the same underlying, you know, pathophysiology. 100%. It adds to the complexity of some of this because it would be great if you had to have all five symptoms together and then it'd be like, yep, that's LPR. But unfortunately, it's not. Now, I will say that there are some symptoms that I just do not think are LPR. So not every symptom you have in your throat is LPR, right? You can have primary laryngeal reflux, and that can cause weird feelings in the throat as well. Um, unilaterality, I, I take seriously. Um, so if patients come in and they're like, there is this feeling in the left side of my throat only, that is unlikely to be LPR. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. And I see that diagnosed as LPR all the time. But that's probably a primary laryngeal hypersensitivity, and that's a whole different topic. But the unilaterality usually makes me very suspicious that it's not a reflux problem. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. And and for patients who, you know, have GERD, so gastroesophageal reflux disease, which is so common. I mean, you look at patients' medication lists and almost everyone is on a PPI these days. What is the the interplay of that? Like if you have GERD, are you more likely to have LPR? Can you have it in the absence of that? Like what is, how do those interplay? Definitely. You know, a lot of times, obviously we refer back to the literature in terms of what does, you know, literature tell us. And the problem is, is that our definition of LPR has evolved so much over time and our diagnostic criteria is pretty poor currently. So to really get a true incidence is difficult, but I will tell you that from what we know in the literature, um, if patients have true GERD, um, they're definitely more likely to have LPR type of symptoms, which makes sense, right? Because they're they're definitely having that volume reflux or that acid reflux. With LPR, it's a little bit more complex. Um, we think that very few people probably are having true GERD symptoms. And I think we all see that clinically where patients will say, I don't have reflux. I don't have acid reflux. And I believe them. They're they're not feeling heartburn. But the tricky thing is, is you can still have reflux and not feel the heartburn, right? That's why we like to call it silent reflux, which to be honest, isn't really true either because it's not silent. You're clearly having symptoms. You just didn't know that those were symptoms of reflux. And so silent reflux is kind of a little bit, you know, I use that term all the time myself, but that's not really true either. It's it's not silent. That's why you're here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've, it's so common to have patients say, but I no, 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 I don't have reflux. No, it's not that. <laughs> so let's get into, you know, diagnostic criteria. So how, how do we say for sure, okay, you, you know, your symptoms are related to LPR because of, you know, boom, 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 these things. So what are you looking for when you start to kind of move on to your physical exam, your scope exam? So I, for any throat complaint, I always offer flexible nasal laryngoscopy, no matter what the throat symptoms, that's why you're here to see me and I need to do that physical exam. I think it's really important to understand though, when I'm doing my scope, I'm not doing it to rule in reflux. I'm doing it to rule out other things, right? So I'm doing a physical exam because I don't want to assume that there's some reflux there and you had glottic insufficiency or a polyp or something contributing, right? So I'm doing it to rule out things. Now, classically, when we think about LPR findings, we think of certain things, right? So we definitely all think of that post-cricoid edema or erythema the classic intra-arytenoid bar of mucosal hypertrophy. Um, we think of kind of mucus at the level of the vocal folds, right? So the vocal folds themselves are producing mucus. And then we think of like the pseudosulcus. So the pseudosulcus is that kind of thickening where it looks at kind of chronic edema type of picture on the undersurface of the vocal folds. Lingual tonsil irritation, hypertrophy has been associated as well with LPR. The challenge with all of these are a lot of these findings are subjective. Right. So is my intrarytenoid bar, you know, what you would call a bar? What is postcricoid edema? Like what if someone's just born with that size of postcricoid mucosa? And and that's definitely very challenging. Now, a lot of my colleagues, a hot topic in laryngology these days is kind of the artificial intelligence world, right? So can we upload these images onto a program that could then give us a diagnosis? Sure, that would be fantastic if if that gets developed, but currently it's incredibly subjective what we see. And so what I always tell patients, because this is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, is that, you know, they'll say, well, I was scoped and they saw reflux. Well, no, um, you can't see reflux because it's happening in your esophagus. What they saw were signs that looked like your larynx was irritated. Okay. But again, that's not a direct 
definition of LPR, right? Because lots of things can irritate. So the reason we scope is to make sure we're not missing something. You know, I've had cough patients where we found a tumor, right, causing their cough or dysphagia and there's a hypophringeal tumor. Like the reason we scope is to make sure we're not missing anything else. And then we kind of look for signs of really, really inflammation. But most of these patients, I mean, you know, when we scope them, there's not really anything striking. It's all very kind of subtle changes. And again, how much of that is somebody's baseline? Well, you know, we don't scope everyone all the time. So it's really challenging to use your scope to make an actual diagnosis. So coming back to your question about like what diagnostic testing or tools are available to us, I mean, we're somewhat limited right now. I do consider the gold standard for diagnosis of LPR, kind of the 24-hour pH impedance test. That's probably the best diagnostic tool we currently have. This is also incredibly limited because it is not necessarily an easy test. It's not offered in a lot of ENT practices. Um, it is, it's uncomfortable for patients. And so part of what I do when I see patients, again, a lot of them have already seen an ENT previously, but what we talk about is the test. Um, we talk about it being kind of the gold standard for diagnosis. And then we say, well, if you're not ready and I can understand that, right, for these symptoms, then we can talk about perhaps empirically treating you. But we have to be very clear that it's an empiric treatment. Right. So I cannot say that you actually have LPR if we're empirically treating you. But again, a lot of these are quality of life symptoms. We've ruled out big, bad things. We have the flexibility to kind of work through some of this. With your scope exam, is is stroboscopy ever, you know, does that ever add anything or really, you know, you just need to look down there and make sure you're not seeing anything, you know, bad? Yeah, I would say for the, I mean, as a laryngologist, I love my stroboscopy, right? So I'm like a poster <laughs> child. I have it on my hoodie, that sort of thing. But the reality of it is for most patients, a initial stroboscopy is not realistic, right? Like to say that, oh, you need to strobe everyone. Let's, let's, you know, be a little bit realistic here. No, primarily nasolaryngoscopy, distal chip ideally, but even flexible fiber optic is fine for initial diagnosis. I add stroboscopy into my practice when there's things such as, for example, chronic cough, and especially if the patient's older, right? So I'm really looking for that glottic insufficiency. If the primary complaint is something like hoarseness, then of course I want to add stroboscopy if they're coming to see me. But for a lot of these, like for example, globus and stuff as an initial um, scope, I think realistically just a plain nasal laryngoscopy is good. And these, the findings that we talked about are that that you listed, they are, you know, would you say pretty nonspecific? So like could could be caused by other things too or? A hundred percent. Yeah. And that's, that's the reason why I don't like saying that this scope proves you have LPR because if you're, if your patient's coming in and they're like, I've been throat clearing for two years, well, of course they're going to have mucus on their vocal folds, right? It's, it's the chicken and the egg, like which one came first, right? So the act of throat clearing itself will produce mucus. The act of chronically coughing will cause pseudosulcus and irritation at the vocal fold level. You know, so a lot of these things can be the result of the symptom itself as opposed to causing the symptom. Yeah, that pseudosulcus. Like sometimes, you know, I see it in patients that don't have any <laughs> complaint of their throat too. And I'm like, right, huh. <laughs> Well, that's that's there. Yeah. <laughs> right. We see it in our elderly patients, too, with the idea being that it's probably somewhat compensatory for some of the presbyloryngeal changes that are happening. So, you know, if you if you treat every pseudosulcus with the PPI, which unfortunately probably does happen in some places, you're doing an injustice to patients. Yeah. And so get, getting into, you know, empiric, um, you know, medical therapy, you know, when I was in residency, it was PPI. Like we would, you know, the main thing would be, you know, okay, the good thing is your scope exam, you know, is, is you know, pretty normal. We're not seeing anything that looks like cancer. This is probably LPR because that's, you know, kind of the <laughs> wastebasket <laughs> diagnosis. So, you know, we're going to try PPI. You need to make sure you take it on an empty stomach at the beginning of the day. Here's some dietary modifications, you know, yada, yada, yada. What's the what's the latest paradigm? What are you um, doing for patients when you talk about, you know, um, if, if they decide they want to hold off on that um, pH probe? Yeah. So definitely we talk about the effects of lifestyle on the throat, right? And so lifestyle meaning what you're eating, drinking, when you're eating and drinking, and then smoking, right? So smoking, vaping, marijuana, all of those things. So we always talk about, you know, symptoms are generally describing symptoms of laryngeal irritation, 
what irritates our larynx and are there ways in your own personal lifestyle that you can make some of those adjustments, right? So coffee is usually a big one, late night eating for a while there, especially in the summer, carbonated water. Um, is is a huge issue, especially with the lovely flavors that exist and stuff. Mm-hmm. So um, that usually we talk about where in your own personal diet that you can maybe make a few adjustments because everybody's triggers can be a little bit different. The decision to add on an antacid again, I I support it when it's needed. These are these are great medications. These you know have saved lives and improved the quality of life for many people. It's just the discussion should be, why am I giving you an antacid or why am I recommending it? So definitely if patients describe traditional GERD symptoms, like, yeah, I have heartburn a lot, feeling a lot of burning, you know, that sort of thing, then I say, yeah, we should add on an antacid. I talk to patients about the idea that, you know, 50% of patients with LPR don't improve with an antacid or PPI. Again, the problem with part of this is what was, how was the LPR initially diagnosed? But I'm very upfront with patients that, hey, there are these medications called proton pump inhibitors. I can't tell you that they will do anything for you, but it's definitely an option once we talk about the potential risk factors of taking them. For short-term course treatments, most patients are open to giving it a try, right? So if they, again, have any sort of acid reflux symptoms, I definitely recommend it. If they don't have acid reflux symptoms, then I offer it, say, we can try it. Or your alternative would be something known as an alginate suspension, which tries to address more of the mechanical reflux component of it. Everybody gets the recommendations for the diet, behavior, smoking, vaping, all of that stuff. Yeah. And for for the lifestyle modifications, you know, when you talk to people about taking away coffee, like sometimes I get that like, look, like, don't take away my coffee, you know, like, yeah, is it completely zero coffee or, you know, no caffeine at all? Or can it be like, okay, like, let's just, you know, limit it to, you know, one cup in the morning, like, or, or is everybody different? So what, what I say with that is, again, when I've scoped you and I've ruled out sort of any big bad things, we, we have a really heart to heart conversation here about this is quality of life, which means the ball is in your court. Okay. Raise your hand if you've ever had LPR symptoms. And I raise my hand. I was like, I get LPR all the time. And that's why I feel very comfortable talking to patients about this in a realistic manner. If you enjoy something and it brings you joy, okay, whether that's your morning coffee, if that's Friday night barbecue, whatever it is, put it into context of what you're feeling. You clearly came to see me because something was bothering you. I'm trying to provide you reassurance, help be a guide here for your journey but this is all quality of life. Okay. So we have our worrisome characteristics when we talk about reflux, which our GI colleagues are great at handling. Um, We've scoped the larynx. We've taken a look at it. This is all quality of life now. Okay. So if you want to give yourself the best chance of not having these symptoms, then yes, that coffee has to go. But I also understand that quality of life comes in many different forms. And so if that morning cup of coffee, you know, reading the New York Times is what gets you through your day, it's okay, right? So we're we're not trying to take away everything here. We're just trying to guide you. And just kind of, you know, equip them with that information that like, oh, right. if you feel a little bit more phlegm after, you know, after your coffee in the morning, yeah. you know, just be like, yeah, but it was worth it. <laughs> or it wasn't, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And And is that, you know, out of, when you think about the lifestyle modifications, the biggest, you know, offenders from a diet standpoint, would it be kind of the same things we think about as we do like things that cause heartburn? So, you know, coffee, acidic beverages, you know, tomato based kind of like think of like Italian food, like pizzas and like, yeah. you know, stuff like that. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely the acidity in the food, right? So citrus is a big one, cooked tomatoes. I try to explain to patients, it still irritates your throat on the way down. So that's why you still have to do that even if you're doing something like an acid suppression trial because the PPI doesn't work on the way down, right? It only helps once it hits the stomach. So that all has to go kind of hand in hand. Yeah. You mentioned the late night eating. Um, is there a particular you know, number that you give patients to shoot for as far as like, I want you to stop eating two hours before you lay down or, or you know, is there kind of a guideline around that? Yeah. I generally tell them about two to three hours. Now, This gets more complex with some of our more medically complex patients or diabetics or elderly who probably have a little bit more slowing in the GI tract. But generally, the initial guideline is kind of like two to three hours. And as far as your, um, you know, the PPI therapies, I will frequently have patients ask me about the safety of being on that for like long term. I think 
short trials are helpful because if it does help, it allows us to say, okay, like that is what's going on. And then if it does help, does that mean we're going to, you know, continue that therapy for, you know, indefinitely? And is that safe? Yeah. So big concern over kind of acid suppression over the last couple of years, and it's kind of made its way into kind of popular culture and media and stuff as well. So I, I very honest with patients, I'm like, listen, proton pump inhibitors are awesome drugs for what they do, right? So they really suppress kind of acid. And there's a whole population of patients that benefit from this. When we're doing something empirically trying, there's going to be the potential for some side effect, right? All drugs, every drug out there will cause some potential side effect. My initial trial is usually one to two months. And, and the reason I say one to two months is it really depends on the severity of the symptoms patients are having. So if they're really severe, I want to see them in a month as opposed to kind of more general things. And I kind of space it out to about two months. I tell patients that we would expect something to be different by that one to two month mark. Now, everything is probably not going to be gone, but you would expect to see some result. If there is no result, then I do not think you need acid suppression, right? That's that's a fair trial. If there is some response, then we really kind of talk about, am I concerned about you being on this longer or can we kind of push it a little bit? And that's really based on kind of underlying medical conditions and that sort of thing. When we talk about the side effects of proton pump inhibitors, we're really talking about the side effects of acid suppression. And we know that our bodies need acid. Acid is really good. It just needs to stay where it needs to stay, right? So as long as it stays where it's in the stomach, it, it helps with digestion, absorption of calcium, magnesium, B12. That's all fantastic. Now, the tricky part of all this is what does long term mean? Like, when is it long term? Is that like a year? Is that two years? You know, we mentioned the medical records and having patients on proton pump inhibitors. People don't even know. They're like 10 years, 15 years. That's a problem. That That's really a problem because 10 to 15 years of chronic acid suppression. I mean, you can't get those patients even off of PPIs at that point. So when I talk to patients about long term, again, I'm very upfront being like the literature says that there's potential for these side effects but it does not tell us what long-term means. So I would say for you, we would talk about doing this, this course of treatment or this type of follow-up with the idea being that we should try to get people off of these medications almost 100% of the time. At what point, you know, are we talking like, you know, months or years or when do you say like, okay, we need to get you off of this? So usually what I do is when at that two-month follow-up with patients, we talk about it. So we actually talk about, should we try tapering you off? Because often when I first start and I'm doing an empiric trial, um, I'll put them on a high dose, right? Because I'm like, if we're going to do this, let's do this, right? Like, let's go 100% into this acid suppression for a short period to really see if there's any effect. So at the two-month mark, I definitely want to start bringing you down. Okay. And when I mean high dose, I mean like 40 milligrams. Um, usually I do omeprazole. I've transitioned away from the BID twice a day and instead doing a high dose Pepsid at night to get that kind of dual coverage. Um, so definitely at the first follow-up, we talk about coming down on the dose now. Um, so we start tapering right off the bat. And then we talk about, you know, we can do this slowly over a few months. If you really, a lot of patients come to me and they're like, I want to get off of the medication now. So then we go a little faster with it, with the idea being that you may need to restart it again, and then we would bring you off again. So when we talk about chronic kind of disease or illness, you know, you talk a lot about it's unlikely to be a one time and then you'll never feel it again. But if you do notice again, we can restart it. And what, what is your dosage for your Pepsid? I do 40 as well. 40. For the initial trial. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, if we're going to do it, let's just make sure it's not the dose is too low. I see lots of patients being put on things like 20 milligrams. That's too low. That That's fine for heartburn. Mm -hmm. But if we're trying to talk about extra esophageal symptoms and we want to just do an empiric trial for short term, let's put you on a higher dose and then bring you down. So 40 omeprazole in the morning, 40 Pepsid in the evening for one to two months. And does it matter as far as taking the omeprazole on an empty stomach? Is that a is that important? Yeah. Yeah. So you want to definitely take it empty stomach. I usually tell patients about 45 minutes before they eat. So usually breakfast. And ideally, the breakfast would have something like protein in it to help activate the um, pumps that the PPI is then turning off. So if we're again, if we're going to take it, we want to do kind of a decent dose and we want to take it properly to give the drug the best chance of helping. Pepsid works best at night, actually, so after meals. And there are some studies that show that it actually has some anti-dysmotility properties, mild kind of effect on that as well. So I usually do the Pepsid at night. Gotcha. And for 
patients wanting to get off these medications, or let, let's say you've done your trial and you know it's time to come off. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you you it's important to taper because if you just kind of you know decided one day, okay, I'm not going to take any of these medications anymore, you can get like a, a rebound kind of hyper secretion of acid. Is that still correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. So the longer that you've been on it, the more prominent that effect will be. And that's why patients will say, yeah, I tried to stop it, but I need it because I got heartburn. And like, well, I don't really know that that's true, but you definitely felt heartburn because of the rebound. So I usually tell patients you might have up to five days of rebound heartburn. So to help prevent that rebound heartburn, which can be very uncomfortable, let's taper you down. And so we generally do kind of like half. So we'll go from 40 to 20 and then I'll do 20 and kind of every other day, maybe add an extra Pepsid if they need it, kind of customize that part for patients, give them some options. But yeah, we definitely want to taper so that you don't get rebound heartburn symptoms. And if during the taper, if they start to experience their laryngeal symptoms again, whether it be the, the mucus or the throat clearing or what, whatever it it was, at some point you say like, okay, we're going to hold this dose for a little while and then maybe try again, you know, try to taper down a little bit later or how, how does that work? Yeah, that same, exactly. That's how, how we do it. So again, if, if as you're tapering, symptoms start to come back. I talk to them about, you know, your options are to either go back to the dose that was taking care of your symptoms, okay, with the understanding that we're doing this with, with acid suppression or see how you feel. If, if they're kind of back, but they're not that bothersome and you feel comfortable, then let's continue the tapering. Um, so definitely kind of customize it at that point. And, and think, you know, with the, the alginate therapies, like I think I was introduced to the alginates maybe a, a few years ago, which I really like. And um, I think patients, I've noticed more and more that the patients are having more of a negative feel about being on, you know, PPIs and the, with the alginate therapies. It's, um, you know, meaning like Gaviscon or Reflux Gourmet, and there may be others, but it's a different, you know, different type of medication, different mechanism of action that I think people are a little bit more open to. Can we um, switch gears and, you know, talk about, about those and how they work? Yeah. So natural is the way most people kind of trend towards now, right? Like natural is considered better. And so the alginate suspensions offer kind of a, a good option for wanting to take something, right, more than just like not drinking coffee, but trying to lean towards the more natural aspects of it. So I think it also makes sense to patients when you talk about how an alginate suspension works, because again, I'm saying reflux is contributing to your symptoms. I didn't say acid is contributing to your symptoms. I said reflux. And so with these alginate suspensions, they use the mechanism of normal acid production to be activated, right? So your normal acid is in your stomach. You take an alginate suspension. It hits that normal acid that's meant to be there um, and creates kind of a raft or a barrier to help reduce the amount of movement or reflux that's happening. So again, I'm not suppressing your acid, you know, for digestion and all of that. Um, but we're trying to limit the amount of movement that's happening to hopefully help your throat symptoms. How do you dose that? What, what do you recommend for patients just taking it after they eat or in the evenings or? So usually after meals um, because it, the acid production gets revved up during mealtime. And that's what we're really trying to limit um, the kind of movement of. So usually after meals, sometimes I'll throw in a bedtime, especially if they have a lot of morning symptoms. So like the morning mucus, morning throat clearing, um, or if they're waking up at night because of symptoms. Are there any contraindications or interactions that we need to be aware of or careful with when using those medications? Yeah, generally I don't use them with other forms of acid suppression because again, they need acid to kind of go into suspension. And so I usually, when I first started, I would give them kind of hand in hand, but I stopped doing that. It's kind of a, you pick which which pathway you want to be on, acid suppression or alginate suspension. Um, not too many contraindications. Um, some of them, like the original Gaviscon, does have a lot of sodium in it. So that's one thing to kind of be mindful of. Um, I've had a few people have some lower GI issues with it. I think with any sort of GI medication, that's possibility for the lower GI issues exists, uh, like diarrhea and colitis and things like that. So I, I tell patients to look out for that sort of stuff, um, but generally they're well tolerated. And they shouldn't interact with any other medications that they're taking or affect the absorption of them really, right? Yeah, they really shouldn't, no. Okay, so I feel like we've done a really good job of kind of breaking down the empiric medical therapy part. Anything else we need to cover for that before we kind of move on to, you know, pH probe and 
testing. I, I will say that there's some exciting stuff on the horizon. So one of the things that we really aren't addressing with any of these empiric trials really is kind of the idea of pepsin damage or non-acid damage. There are some exciting kind of trials and things being done with some HIV medications, actually, that have anti-pepsin properties. So yeah, there's some exciting stuff in the field coming. There may be an, an anti-pepsin treatment out on the market soon. So that will kind of, I think, be a little bit of a game changer and kind of add a little bit to all of this. Yeah, so some exciting kind of changes in the medical treatment of LPR. Very cool. And okay, so so that'll be something to to look out for that might be coming up on the horizon. So right now, for your patients who are like, look, I've been to 10 ENTs and we've I've tried all the therapies and now I'm coming to see you because you're the expert and let's do this, you know, pH probe monitoring thing. Like, let's get, let's get into that. Like, what, what's that conversation go like? What does it entail as far as, you know, putting that in and having, you know, what, what happens with that? So being kind of a laryngologist, when I first started in practice, I was like, you know, I need to be able to offer something different, right? Because if I'm just offering what everyone else is offering, how is this a subspecialty kind of visit? And so I started actually doing my own pH impedance probe placement just to be able to offer that to patients. Um, so that's what we talk about. We say basically this is really the only diagnostic tool we currently have. It's not perfect by any means, but it's what we have. And so generally what we do is I actually place the catheter. So I have a nurse um, place it kind of like she would like an NG tube. And then I scope through the other side and just watch the placement of it. So I can see that it's being placed with the probes at the post region. So it's, it's yeah, it's kind of uncomfortable. I tell patients it's going to feel, you know, kind of weird having something in your throat. Most patients do not enjoy the whole experience. But by the time, again, that they're coming to see me, they're really bothered by these symptoms. They need some more information. So we, we offer it. They usually come back the next day. Um, and then we're able to review kind of the recording um, and look for episodes of reflux and if it correlates to the symptoms that they that they're having. Okay. And that that catheter or that that probe that when it's placed is the tip of it um, just beyond the upper esophageal sphincter, or does it go all the way down? Yeah. So I actually use the GI one. There are some on the market, for example, that just sit in kind of the nasopharynx. And for me, I, I felt like if I was going to do it, I want to know kind of what's happening in the esophagus as well. Because if we see a lot of distal issues, I need to get my GI colleagues involved, right? And if we want, we can talk a little bit about how we interact with GI with all of this as well. But I, I decided if I was going to do it, I wanted to do the full the full probe. Gotcha. And is there like a marker on the probe that lets you know? There is. That's how you know the depth, basically. Yeah. So two ways. When GI does it, they obviously don't scope in the office. And so they can use a pressure gauge to mark kind of when they're at the lower sphincter. For ENT, scoping is so, you know, routine for us that I usually just scope to see where the upper marker is. Okay. Is there any reason to do, um, you know, either esophagoscopy in the OR or, you know, transnasal esophagoscopy in the office? Does that, is that ever, you know, give you any additional information that you need? Yeah. I mean, there's definitely patients where that is recommended. And I think a lot of that has to do with the symptoms of it. So if any traditional GERD symptoms, any concerning symptoms, for sure, I get my GIs involved incredibly early in this process, um, even maybe the first visit based on the symptoms. Um, for some of these very upper symptoms, if it's more kind of like globus, probably would, and we're not getting anywhere, would, it would include kind of an esophagoscopy uh, in that workup. It's it's tricky when we're talking about things like dysphagia, because usually we end up doing some imaging early on for that as well, even if we think it's due to LPR. So definitely work kind of hand in hand with the, the GI component here. And um, let's talk about kind of interpreting those results. So you, you, so you get the catheter, everything in place, and uh, I assumed it's hooked up to some sort of monitoring device. So they just kind of clip that on their belt or their shirt or something. Yeah, it's kind of like a little messenger bag purse type of thing that they have that's continuously recording. Um, and then patients have the ability to press buttons based on symptoms. So there's a button for, you know, you can program it for three symptoms that they might be having. So they can press when they have the symptom. And then they can also press a button when they're starting a meal, um, laying supine, that sort of thing. So for about 24 hours, 
It's continuously recording. Patients come in the next day. The nurse is able to just remove the catheter, just make sure it's still taped in place and that it didn't shift. And then we we take the recording. There's programs that come with it, which will kind of plot out the kind of the pH and then time stamp it for symptoms. Um, and so the program is really helpful because it does all of that plotting for you. And then then you can look at how many kind of reflux events the patient have. We have some normative data from GI which again is primarily based on distal esophageal reflux events, but we do have some for, um, you know, the pharynx. The tricky part about where this gets to not being a perfect test is the idea that like, what if there is no correlation, but you see reflux events, right? For GI, for GERD, they consider that negative if there's no correlation. With ENT or laryngology, we're a little bit softer on that because we do know that there's a neurosensory network. So I usually look for any sort of events. The correlation part I'm not as concerned about because if people are having LPR events, yeah, an hour later they could have throat clearing, right? There's a little bit of a temporal delay in throat symptoms as compared to heartburn. So I'm looking really for any type of reflux events. If there's correlation, fantastic, but often there just isn't that exact correlation. Does it break it up between acidic and non-acidic events? It does. That's why I like the pH impedance probe because I tell patients it will tell me about your lower esophagus and upper, and it'll tell me if it's acidic or not, and then it tells me if there's any correlation. So it does provide a lot of information. Again, the alternative would be an empiric trial. So it provides a lot more information than us just looking with the scope. And then what do you do with that information? So once you have established that a patient is having reflux events, whether acidic or non-acidic, does your treatment look similar to what your empiric treatment was going to look like, or is it different? No, definitely. So if I see a lot of abnormal amount of acid, then I know this patient should be on an acid suppressing medication. If we see a lot of non-acid reflux, then I usually talk to them about the alginate suspension. And for both of these, if we're seeing a lot of reflux and it kind of encourages patients and like, listen, there's a lot of kind of dysmotility or something happening here contributing to this reflux. By the time that they come for the testing, most of these patients have already tried the diet, behavior. You know, they're very strict about it. So if you're still having a lot of dysmotility, then we probably need to add further testing in that way with regards to motility testing. We need to get our GI colleagues involved. And I even refer some patients for surgery, um, for reflux surgery, if we see it there. What's the the most common reflux surgery these days? Is it is it still... Um... Oh, like a Nissen? Yeah, you know, I actually, I'm seeing a lot more of like the Lynx procedure, kind of like a endoscopic kind of magnetic tightening of the lower esophageal sphincter. So there's definitely more endoscopic. There's also one called the TIF, which is more like kind of like radio frequency, but there's definitely more endoscopic options for patients now. I obviously don't do those surgeries, but there's different criteria. If someone has like a massive hiatal hernia, then yeah, they're probably going to offer the fund application. But for these patients with um, some of these more dysmotility or more reflux events without that hiatal hernia, there are some endoscopic options available for patients. I think having this type of testing helps kind of guide patients where they should go next or how much more diagnostic workup they should have as opposed to just the person who first time comes in your office. Yeah, it, I'm sure it's it's nice to have some objective um, information to kind of share with patients to say, okay, look, you know, this is what's happening, you know, as opposed to the, well, let's try these medications and see what happens. You know, some people really like to kind of have that data, hard facts about like what's happening. Yeah. And the, and the other challenging thing is how we think about LPR is very different than how GI thinks about LPR. And so if you send a patient and say, I think you need an upper endoscopy because you're coughing, you know, it depends on who, which GI sees that patient, but a lot of times they'll be like, well, you're not having reflux, so we don't need to do that upper endoscopy, right? So patients get bumped kind of back and forth between my ENT says it's LPR, my GI says I don't have reflux, I, I don't know what's going on. And that unfortunately happens quite often. And so I think if you can provide some additional information to GI, say, hey, I did this pH impedance test and there's these reflux events occurring. Well, now they have an indication, right? Now they have a reason to go and make sure that the esophagus is healthy. 
So it, it just helps kind of work together for some of these patients. Yeah, that makes sense. And as far as refractory cases, you know, you mentioned getting GI involved, um, looking at motility studies. Anything else that we need to be thinking about for patients who we've demonstrated that there definitely is reflux? We've done, you know, the pH um, impedance testing, and then we've tried these medications and things just aren't getting better. What do you do at that point? Yeah, so then we start having really the conversation about kind of neurosensory reflux, right? With the idea being that you might be having normal amount of reflux that we all have, but the the response to it is heightened. Um, and so then we start talking about the use of kind of neuromodulators, such as gabapentin, amitriptyline. Um, amitriptyline is often used for functional heartburn as well. The idea being that patients are feeling burning, but there's no abnormal amount of acid there. And so we start talking about the use of some of those medications. Um, I've actually started to do a lot of um, superior laryngeal nerve blocks for irritable larynx syndrome, those type of things. So with the idea being that there, again, is a sensory component to a lot of this, but that, again, that's more of a diagnosis of exclusion, right? So um, a lot of times patients have to go through a lot of this other testing and empiric trials and all of that. The other thing I will say is if a patient comes to me um, as a second opinion or third opinion, um, we still start from the beginning, right? So I still do a good nasal exam, make sure, you know, if I'm concerned about allergies, have we tested for that? Sometimes we need to repeat some of this testing, keep it all kind of within the same time period, because if you had testing 20 years ago, and then you did your PPI trial three years ago, is that really where I'm at now? So patients, you know, kind of being very upfront about, yeah, I understand you've had this done before, but if we're going to do the second opinion, we got to kind of start fresh here and start checking off boxes. So just kind of expectations for patients laying them out at the very beginning. Another thing I wanted to ask you about, something that's kind of like, I feel like trendy hot topic these days is like talking about the microbiome and how does that kind of play into all of this? And, you know, is that, are we going to start thinking about that when we talk about, you know, reflux and LPR? Yeah. So that was actually something I was, um, before leaving my, to go to this new position, that was something I was actually working on and researching because I do believe that there is relationship between the microbiome and, and reflux in general. We know that's well documented. Um, I think that this has a lot of implications um, in terms of who develops these symptoms, right, right off the bat, and then the negative potential for some of the ways we treat this. So um, by using acid suppression, we are changing the microbiome of the GI tract, and we know that has implications for things such as Parkinson's, right? So there, these things are all interconnected. So I, I do think that there is a connection there. So in the future, we might we might be using, you know, probiotics or some sort of, you know, bacteria, you know, bacteria readjustment to get, you know, symptoms under control. I don't know. Yeah, we definitely, I do talk about probiotics with patients, again, as more of a kind of natural type of treatment option. The tricky thing with some of these probiotics is the the idea that they're not really being absorbed anyways, right? That like people can market and sell probiotics, but are they actually being absorbed? It, that that part is very difficult to really figure out if it's actually doing anything. And like the different, you know, different strains and different mixtures of it. It's like there's no standardization yet of like what what is the right, you know, mix of bugs to have in your gut. And it's different for different people. Well, um, wonderful. We've we've gone deep into LPR. I think we've, <laughs> we've got, covered it really well. Any anything that I've missed? Anything that we need to make sure um, we we leave our listeners with? Yeah. No. I think um, I think those are great conversation today, today, Ashley. Thank you. I think just the idea that LPR can have different subgroups and subtypes. And so I think if we can, as a field, have a little bit of consistency and understanding that it's not just an acid problem, I think we will help our patients a lot just by that. Yeah, that's new to me. So I, I will, you know, go forth and, and better describe LPR to my patients now. <laughs> awesome. And, um, and I can't let you go without just, um, you know, commenting and shining a light on your, you know, social media presence, you know, got, um, I, I, you know, follow you on Instagram, but you're also on Twitter and TikTok. T tell me about that. You know, it's, it was great. It's just a great way to connect and outreach. And I, I started doing it as a way for 
for me to find connection with others in my field. And what I found was that a lot of connection with patients and educating. I joke around that I've kind of become like the mucus queen on Instagram and TikTok. I did not realize there were so many people who really are looking for help with that regard. But yeah, I've kind of become the mucus queen of social (laughs) media talking about these issues. And I talk to the kind of followers like I would with patients and just being kind of authentic and just helping to get patients where they can find care. So I think with laryngology, it's definitely helped get patients to the laryngologist nearest to them um, and just kind of knowing that we're out there. Yeah, it's it's certainly a, a service to to patients um, because that's that's how patients get their information these days. They're, they're out there, they're looking for it. And so to kind of be a shining star that's is someone who's putting out good information, um, I think that's, it's wonderful, it's awesome. If our listeners want to find you, what are your handles on your various social media platforms? Oh, sure. So um, on Instagram, I'm just Inna Hussein MD. And then at TikTok, I'm Throat Doc. Nice. Throat Doc. Okay. Check out Inna Hussein. Thank you so much. Thank you. For taking the time today. It was so fun. We appreciate you. Thank you. Reach out to Inna and, and let her know how this landed for you. And if you have any questions, hit her up on, on the socials, follow her, and um, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable ENT on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable ENT is hosted by Gopi Shaw and Ashley Agan. Our audio team lead is Karen Yen with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor's version Hess. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.